In the teaching for this morning, we want to talk about a topic in the Bible that affects every day of our life. In fact, it affects just about every hour, the majority of the hours of our day, every day. And that is the topic of relationships. And I'm not just talking about relationships with our family or with our spouse, but I'm talking about relationships with friends, with acquaintances at work, with colleagues. Uh, I'm talking about relationships with people at church, brothers and sisters in the Lord. And so what we're going to be talking about today covers that whole wide spectrum, but certainly especially uh, husband and wife relationships and relationships within the family because those are the closest of our relationships. But the specific topic that we want to talk about this morning is that topic of communication. Because as I put in the notes there, your relationship will live or die based upon its communication. Communication is what all of your relationships hinge upon. You know, it, it, it was uh, a while ago you would hear it said, and I believe it, it's true, that uh, all of the problems or most of the problems in a marriage all boil down to either communication, sex, or money. Typically, it's in one of those three areas. But I think we can even take it back to the one area of communication because if proper communication is in place between you and your spouse, then the differences that might arise with money or with sex can be easily resolved and worked through. And so that's why I put there in your notes, I believe communication is the single most important component to any relationship. And by that one hinge, your relationships will live or die, succeed or fail. And so what you speak out of your mouth will deter de determine the course of that specific relationship. This is what I mean. Look here in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21. Death and life are where? In the power of the tongue. So what are you experiencing in your relationships right now? In your relationships, are you experiencing strife and division and contention and arguing and always disagreeing and always being at odds and always, you know, wrestling with each other verbally, debating, trying to win the argument? Well, chances are that the root of that is what's coming out of your mouth, and that is what you're creating for yourself, for that relationship, because the ver coming from the very words of your mouth. Contrary, you can take your relationships on a course of harmony and peace, and communion, and growth. Your relationships can prosper, and it all starts right here with the mouth. What are you speaking? What's coming out of your mouth? I like, watch what he goes on and says in the last half of this verse. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will what? Eat its fruits. So what fruit are you eating in your relationships right now? What are you experiencing in your relationships right now? And it all comes back to what you have sowed into that relationship with your mouth. What kind of words are you speaking? Are they wholesome words? Are they loving words? Are they words filled with God's spirit and God's word and God's grace? Or are they words that are selfish and arrogant, demanding, divisive? What comes out of your mouth will set the tone and the course of the relationships in your life. And so that's why this topic is so important to study. Look here at Proverbs chapter 25, verse 11. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver. And you can see there that phrase fitly spoken means to speak upon the circumstance. And that is having the wisdom, the discernment, the spiritual aptitude to be able to have a conversation with a person and discern exactly what they need from God's word and from God's grace and to be able to speak into that circumstance what they need to hear. We've all had times, you know, uh, something that we can easily relate to is times of trial and stress and pressure and we didn't know what to do and we were confused and there was just this huge fog of darkness hanging over us, and 
we were depressed, and then someone came along and with some life experience and wisdom from the Word of God spoke to us, and the fog divided, and the cloud lifted, and suddenly we had hope and peace and joy once again, all because someone was able to speak into our heart and life that word that was fitly spoken. And we felt like we could go on and live to fight another day because we had been encouraged in the Lord and in his word. That's what we're talking about. Words that come with life and hope and peace and rest and joy that build us up instead of tearing us down. That's a word that is fitly spoken from someone who is discerning and wise enough in the things of God to be able to speak into your life. That's what we want to do for other people. That's what we want to be to our husbands. That's what we want to be to our wives. That's what we want to be to our children, especially. That's what we want to be to our brothers and sisters in the Lord at church. Now watch what he goes on to say here in Proverbs 25, 11. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of what? Silver. Both the gold and the silver are precious metals. We know that. Gold, of course, being more valuable, the most valuable in this example. Wouldn't you love to have some apples of gold lying around? Can you imagine, you know, solid gold the size of an apple? You'd like to have a whole bushel of those, you know? That'd be some uh, good chunk of change there. It's like apples of gold set in silver. And, you know, the setting of something, how something is framed, displays its value in such a way that it can be easily perceived and easily appreciated. And that's what this verse is talking about here. You know, you take a diamond, and a diamond is valuable. A diamond can be very pretty to look at. But if it's just a diamond all by itself, it's just kind of like a, you know, it, you could almost mistake it for a piece of broken glass. I mean, it's not really, you know, you, sometimes you just really don't know exactly what you're looking at because it's just kind of sitting there. But when a diamond is set in a proper setting and it sets it up and now it's displayed in such a way that people can look at it and appreciate it and discern it for what it is, that's sweet. That's when it gets really good. And so what he's saying in this, um, in this verse here is that it's not just what you say, but it's how you say it, how you frame it, how you set it up. You know, you take a picture, and you print out a picture, and you give it to someone. They look at it, oh, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a nice picture. But then you frame that picture properly, and you put just the, the correct width of matting around it, and then you set it off with a frame, and whether you use a, a thin frame or a big chunky frame, or whether you mat it with a little width, or whether you mat it with a lot of width all the way around, you know, and you frame the picture in such a way, you can really make that picture pop and come to life. You, you can turn that good picture into a great picture all because of how you frame it because now you're displaying it in a way where its true value can be perceived and appreciated. That's what a word fitly spoken is. We've all had situations in our life where someone, what they said to us was good and true, but the way they said it was lousy. Have you had that, those experiences in your life where, you know, what you're saying to me is really speaking to me. The truth you're saying is, the truth that's coming out of your lips is really speaking to me, but your lousy attitude is yelling at me. And I'm not having a hard time perceiving the truth because your attitude is so bad. Because what you're saying, you're saying just so harshly and so arrogantly. And if you would frame and set up the truth of what you're saying differently in such a way so that the hearer could easily appreciate and discern the value of what you're saying, that's when it becomes a word fitly spoken like apples of gold in a setting of silver. Uh, the way you framed and set it up just really sets off and really displays beautifully the truth and the value of what you're speaking. And so it's not just what we say. It's not just the apples of gold. But it's also the setting of silver, the frame of silver. It's, it's how we display it, how we present it, how we say it, with the heart and the attitude with which we say it with. 
that really sets off the truth. And so that's what we're going to be talking about a little bit this morning is not just what we say, but how we say it, having the right heart when we communicate to make that communication the most effective. Look here at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up as it fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. All right, now, let's start from the beginning. Let no corrupting talk, as you see there in the parentheses, this is, this is talk that is rotten, talk that is unwholesome. How many of you have ever had food poisoning? Where you got some rotten or spoiled or unwholesome food that goes into your system, it makes you sick? I tell you what, I, I haven't had it in a long time, thank God. But I've had food poisoning so bad, I just wanted to die. It made me that sick. And you know, so many times when, when we are the recipient of unwholesome words, harsh words, words of defamation, words, condemning words, intimidating words, it just it goes into our heart, and it, it, it's like food poisoning. It just makes us sick on the inside. You all know what I'm talking about. He's saying, don't let any kind of that talk come out of your mouth. Let no corrupting talk, no. Not just a little, none. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth. But only such as is good for building up. Only words that build up are to come out of your mouth. No corrupting words that make the hearers sick, but only words that are good for building up or edifying, as we know from the King James. This phrase, edifying or to build up, it, it literally means to build a house or to build a structure. And if you have any construction experience, which I don't, but uh, anyway, I'll pretend like I do for a moment. When you go to build a house, you know, and you start to frame it up and you erect the walls, you know, it, at first, that framing that you're performing uh, can be kind of shaky, <laughs> you know. Sometimes you, you, you erect this wall and you kind of put it in place and it's, it's kind of standing up just by one nail that's tapped in at the corner and, you know, the wind blows and kind of the, the walls of the house kind of go like this and that. And you think, wow, this is not going to be a real sturdy house, is it? But, you know, the more you build, the more you attach joists and and all of these different uh, things that go into construction that I know nothing about, and you start putting in more nails and more screws and attaching, you know, now you're putting in drywall and, you know, siding on the outside, or maybe the brick is going up or whatever your house is being constructed with. What's happening? That thing is getting stronger and stronger and more and more structurally sound. And now it can withstand, you know, a hurricane or hopefully a tornado, and, and now it's solid. And that's what the words that have out of our mouth are supposed to do. Now, let me ask you this question. The words that come out of your mouth, are they making your spouse stronger or weaker? Are you building up the house of their life, or are you tearing down their house? Because of the words and the influence of your words in their heart, are they stronger or weaker today? What kind of words are coming out of your mouth? What about your children? What about your friends? And so he's saying here, you know, that word corrupting contextually is the antithesis of building up. So the words that come out of your mouth, are they making people sick or are they making people stronger in the Lord? More secure, more at peace. Only such as is good for building up. And look at this next phrase. As fits the occasion. This goes back to the Proverbs passage about a word fitly spoken. You know, as, as a child of God ministering to family and friends, do you know how to speak exactly what is, at, what, exactly what is needed at exactly the right moment? Do you know how to speak exactly what is needed in exactly the right way at exactly the right moment. That's what this is talking about. The only way you can do that is by the Spirit of God. The only way you can do that 
is, is by a godly life experience. And as you experience how to resist temptation, as you experience how to go through trials, as you experience how to live for God, those are the, the uh, heavenly treasures that then you can pass on to others through communication, through your words as you speak into their life, and it builds them up and makes them stronger and stronger. And you know how to say just the right thing at just the right moment as it fits the occasion. That it may give grace. Look what it goes on to say here. Are you giving grace to people? You see, as you uh, see that it may give grace, look at what it means. It means it's as if you're giving a gift and it should provoke thankfulness. When someone walks away from conversing with you, are they glad? Are they thankful? Or do they walk away saying, I'm never, never going to talk to them again. Learn my lesson, man. That won't happen again. When they leave you, when they walk away, are they thankful? Are they glad they talk to you? Or are they discouraged and put down? Do you minister grace in what you say to those who hear? The words that we speak, we either corrupt or build up. And then I, I put here a list, you know, and halfway through this list, you're going to say, man, this is getting a little redundant. But, you know, it's redundant for a purpose. I really wanted to get some of your thoughts thinking down these lines. The words that you speak can build up or tear down. The words that you speak can minister, po can minister life or poison with death. The words that you speak can minister grace or deliver condemnation. Now, what are your words giving to people? Your words can either, ministry vic can either minister victory or cause defeat. Your words can either encourage or discourage, reconcile or divide, accept or reject, draw closer or push farther, liberate or oppress, enable or paralyze. You know, the, the way, and we'll get into this later, but the way we talk down to our children, the way we, guys, the way we handle our homes and speak to our wives and children sometimes, they are so paralyzed with fear, thinking they're going to do something wrong and have to take all of the grief and abuse from you, and they become paralyzed. They can't even live life. The words that you speak can create tension or it can cause all of the defenses in that other person to relax. So what are your words delivering to people? In that Ephesians passage, you know, where it talks about Ephesians 4, 29, where what we say is to minister grace to the other person, I put there in your notes, communication is not about you. We are so selfish in the way we communicate. We convinced... We are convinced that communication and conversation is for the sole purpose of me being able to vent my frustration and express my opinion and get people to focus on me. Communication, conversation is not about you, it's about the other person. So just get that in your thinking. Train yourself to think this way. It's not about me. It's about this other person. How can I minister to them? What builds them up? What gives them the gift of grace that they need at this specific time? I put there in your notes also, every conversation throughout the day is a channel for God's grace to flow. Do you see it that way? Do you approach every conversation that way? When you, when you start talking with someone in the back of your mind, is it the prayer of your heart, Father, speak through me? Give me the exact words that they need at this exact time in their life. Let me minister your grace and your love to them. Ephesians chapter 4, verse, 20, verse 30. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. When you are delivering unwholesome words, delivering that corruption that's creating that sickness of heart, the Holy Spirit is grieved. And a lot of times we don't take the seriousness of our conversation. We think, what's the big deal? I didn't kill anybody. I didn't steal from anybody. I didn't commit any bad sin. What, 
What's, what's the big deal? Maybe you didn't kill them outwardly, but you killed their heart. You wounded their spirit. You stole from them the life and the joy and the peace of God. God takes this seriously. And when the wrong words come out of your mouth, you're grieving the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit wanted to use you as a vessel and instrument to bring life and wholeness, and instead your words brought death. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God. And then he goes on in verse 31, and he starts talking about some examples of unwholesome conversation. And this is helpful for us to identify in ourselves, you know, is any of this coming out of my mouth? Verse 31, let all bitterness, the bitterness, you know, that, that aspect of just being angry at the world, you're, you're angry at God, angry at the world, angry at everybody you talk to, and it's amazing how many people walk around just angry at life, angry at everybody. It's a poison that just comes out in what they say. Let all uh, bitterness and wrath and anger. Now, you know, I'm not a, uh, a good enough student of languages probably to really be able to explain the difference between wrath and anger because in the English, the words appear very similar. But uh, as much as I can discern, that word wrath there in verse 31 is talking about outbursts of temper in the Greek. In other words, it's talking about having a short fuse being quick to temper to where, you know, you just blow up all of a sudden <laughs> and everybody's around you just kind of shocked at what came out because they weren't expecting this. Where did this come from? And all of a sudden you just <laughs> explode. You know, and, and a lot of times, not all the time, but a lot of times people like that, you know, they, they suddenly get mad quickly and then cool down quickly. And, and then that word anger is a little bit different because it's talking about a, a, a settled state of mind to where you are just always angry, just mad at everybody, mad at every circumstance, you know? It's more of a passion with you. It's how you live. You don't, you don't know how to be anything else but angry. So he's saying in the communication with how we deal and talk to one another, don't let there be any bitterness. Don't let there be any wrath. Don't be quick-tempered. Don't be quick to lose your temper. Let the anger go, man. Just find your peace and rest in God. And stop being mad at the world. Clamor. Clamor, it's really talking about an elevation in volume. You know, when, uh, when someone raises their voice and starts yelling or even screaming, it just shuts people down. People, I mean, they don't even want to be around you. They, they do not hear what you're saying because the, uh, the increased volume creates such confusion and chaos in the environment that uh, they just want to get out. And they're not listening to a thing you say. You're doing more harm than good. You're actually doing no good, and you're doing a lot of harm. Slander, that abusive language to, to speak against that criticism very damnable, very destructive to be around. You know, I've mentioned at times at work where uh, there's certain conversations where if I walk in and I hear they're talking about something, I just turn around and walk out. This criticism, the gossip is one thing that, that I'll just walk out on because it, I mean, the workplace is infamous for everybody ganging up on the boss or ganging up on the newbie or ganging up on somebody you know, that's not pleasing them at that moment, and they just start slandering and criticizing and defaming them, and boy, they, they sure are stupid, and, and all of this kind of talk. He says, that should never come out of your mouth. You should not be someone that slanders or criticizes or gossips or backbites someone else. Those kind of words have no place in our mouth. Along with all malice, malice just means evil intent. You know, I, I grew up, well, I grew up, I, for 25, 26 years, you know, I was always in the bubble of a church, the bubble of a ministry, and then when I went out and got a secular job. I had no idea people have such evil intent. There are people that just don't like people. There are people that hate other people. There, there are people that want to see harm done to other people. There are people that want to hurt other people. It's just malice. It's evil intent. 
And he's saying that should never, ever be the source of the words that come out of our mouth because it's a deadly poison that produces destruction. But then in verse 32, he starts to give the other side. Be kind to one another. And remember, kindness in the New Testament, it's translated goodness in action. Serviceable. Kindness is something that's going to do you a service. It does you good. It's helpful. Look at this other meaning for kindness. Easy. In other words, you're someone who's easy to be around. You're someone who's easy to talk to. You're someone who is easy to receive from. Kindness is not arrogant or insolent or critical. Those are things that are not easy to be around. Be kind to one another. Be tender-hearted. In other words, a heart that's easily touched with the feelings of someone else. And so before you say or do anything, the tender-hearted person always thinks, how is this going to affect them? How are they going to feel after they hear, hear this? Is there anything that I'm going to say or do that could be a needless offense to them? I sure don't want to say something in, in such a way that it's going to hurt them needlessly. So you're tender-hearted. You, you try to make everything as easy on that person to receive as possible. You're tender-hearted. You're compassionate. Forgiving one another, and we're going to talk about that more as we go on. Forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children... You know, we're supposed to be children of God. We're supposed to have his nature, his heart. We're supposed to be imitating our father. That's supposed to be what we want to do. So we want to be like him in being kind and tenderhearted. Walk in love as Christ loved us. And look at this next phrase. He gave himself up for us. Which is uh, like everything else in life. That's the number one requirement for good communication, communication that's kind and tender-hearted, give yourself up. Lay your pride down. Lay your selfishness down. Think about someone other than yourself and learn how to communicate with them in such a way that the words bring life and wholeness to them, words that bring the word of God to them. I made there another list, and let's go through this quickly. Kindness and being tender-hearted overcomes the obstacles in communication. And we have a, you know, there's a lot of obstacles that we face in communication, whether it be with a spouse or family member or friends or brothers and sisters in the Lord. Number one, facial expression. That's a big one. You know, I, uh, it's been a while, but years ago I, I, in the ministry, I used to work with a lot of children and with a lot of youth. And uh, I, I, I heard repeated comments that the youth or the children were afraid of me. And I'm thinking, what do you mean they're afraid of me? There's nothing to be afraid of. I've never done anything harmful to them in my life. What are they afraid of? And, you know, the, the reason why they were afraid was this, you know, not because it's ugly, but because I, I was just always so stern and so serious and so intense. And, you know, I, I had to tell myself, smile. It's okay, you know, and uh, the facial expression is something that we have to think about, you know, and if you smile, people don't have to be afraid of you anymore, and that's a very important form of communication. Tone and volume of voice, the attitude with what something is said, like we said before, what you say can be good and true, but how you say it can just ruin what you said. Oversharing versus undersharing. You know, have you ever uh, talked to someone and you ask them a question, hoping for a simple answer, and pretty soon, uh, I mean, the answer became a ping pong match where it's just ping ponging off of all of these differences. Well, they said and he said, well, this happened when I was 12 years old. Blah blah blah. All I wanted was an answer to the question, please. And you know, and they're going all around uh, oversharing, <laughs> and that can really be frustrating in communication. Or you can go to the opposite extreme of undersharing, you know? 
Well, how was your day today? Well, anything bad happened today? Uh, guess not. Well, anything good happened today? Uh, maybe. <laughs> you know? Talk to me. Let some words come out of your mouth, you know? And so oversharing or undersharing can be uh, two things that are really uh, hurtful to any relationship or to any communication. But see, the kindness and the tenderheartedness will reach past these obstacles, and true communication can begin to take place. What about aggressive versus available? You know, being aggressive in your communication or being available. Let me give you an example. Uh, when Terry and I were newlyweds, very newly married, and I can tell you this story because she, she's not here to hear what I'm saying, but, uh, you know, there, there are times where we may have had a disagreement or a little spat or something, and you know how that is as newlyweds. It doesn't always go real well, right? And uh, I would say something hurtful or sharp or in anger, and she would shut down, uh, refuse to talk, refuse to even look at me. And that would infuriate me so much that I'd wrestle her down to the ground, sit on top of her, and say, now look at me and talk to me. How many of you know that's not the right way to handle it? Okay, so keep that in mind. I'm not promoting that type of response. I'm saying that's not what you want to do. Okay, so don't do that. But that's aggression versus being available. You don't become aggressive and try to force someone to talk to you when they don't want to talk. But you do want to be available and just say, look, you know, I understand that you're either upset or hurt right now. I'm sorry if I did anything that made you that way. I, I want to talk about it. I want to work it out. I want to get everything back out in the open, in the clear. So I just want you to know I'm available. I'm here to talk when you're ready to talk and I'll be patient. So that's what I meant by that. You know, your approach to people. You can't just start demanding things of people because that's the way you want things to go. Oversensitivity, you know, defenses raised, you've got that victim paranoia uh, where you just, you have to walk around on eggshells around this person because they take everything personally, they think everything was pointed in some form of attack against them. Very hard to talk to someone like that or to have an, an open relationship or open communication with them. Overreacting, being irritable, being sharp or abrupt in your responses, that, that shuts down the other person real quick. And it's like, well, I'm never going to ask you anything again if that's the type of response I'm going to get. But see, these are all things that we face every day in relationships and in communication. And if we just exercise some kindness and being tender-hearted towards the person we're speaking to, we could overcome this whole list of obstacles. What about arrogance or selfish ambition? You know, where the conversation's got to revolve all around me, you know? Uh, there used to be someone, you know, if, if we, someone that uh, Terry and I knew, and if we, uh, if we came home from vacation, and we were excited about what we experienced and where we went. We wanted to tell them about our vacation. We would, we would get one or two sentences out about our vacation, and then they would just take off and talking about their vacations and what they did. And, you know, how, I mean, by the end of the conversation, which was really a one-sided discussion, it was kind of like, uh, you know, well, your vacation is never as good as my vacation. This is what we did, and this is what you should have done. And, and it's all about that other person. And it's just arrogance, and it, the conversation it was all about them. <sighs> again, you never want to talk to that person again. That's, that's the way it makes you feel. But see, when you're, when you're kind and tender-hearted, you don't want to selfishly manipulate the conversation. You want it to be give and take, sharing back and forth. You want to give them ample time to express their heart and their interests. Control and manipulation, you know, people that use conversation to exert their will over you and to influence you to do things their way. What about being critical or being condemning or, you know, making the person feel like just a miserable failure or belittling and demeaning where you make them feel like an idiot, like they're stupid? 
or the general lack of interest or concern. You know, just, you know, when you're talking to someone and they kind of have that glazed look over their face and uh, you've got to be interested in what people are saying. You've got to be concerned for the other person. We have to be kind. We have to be tender-hearted. The conversation is not all about me. This conversation is about how can I minister to you to deliver to you that word from the Spirit of God fitly spoken like apples of gold in settings of silver. Communication skills and behaviors which convey God's grace. And boy, we've got to go through this quickly. On the positive side of things, how can we communicate, how can we talk and relate to one another in ways that convey God's grace to that other person? Look at Romans 12, verse 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with what? With good. Overcome evil with good. Proverbs 15, 1. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word just stirs up the anger. So what do you do in light of these two verses? You know, you know what happens when someone comes and gets in your face and starts chewing you out and starts criticizing you or unjustly, uh, you know, starts scolding or disciplining you or talking down to you and being harsh with their words and with their attitude. You know, and your attitude is uh, one of, uh, you know, Jackie Gleason on the Honeymooners where, you know, I'm going to send you to the moon. And uh, he's saying here, when that happens, when evil is being spoken or done to you, don't be overcome by the evil so that you react with evil. But instead, overcome evil with what? With good, because your soft answer can turn away their wrath. You know, they come to you all mean and intimidating and angry and forceful. And for the evil that they just spoke to you in response, you speak good and you're kind and you're gentle and you're patient. And talk about heaping coals of fire on their head, right? And that godly response can instantly diffuse a very destructive situation. Now, the only way you can do that is by the grace of God, by the Spirit of God inside of you, because like Jackie Gleason, when something like that is done to you, you want to send them to the moon, right? But you can't let your emotions get involved and react. You have to handle the situation by the Spirit and grace of God. Proverbs 10, verse 12, hatred just stirs up strife. You know, so if you respond to the evil that's being done to you, if you respond with evil, you're just going to stir up the feud and the fight. So learn how not to do that. But love does what? Love covers all offenses. 1 Corinthians 13, 5. Love is not resentful. And that word resentful means it keeps no account of wrongs. One of the most damaging things you can do in communication, especially with like family members who you have known for a long time, is coming back with comments like, oh, you always do that. You won't change. You've never changed. Remember what you did a year ago? This is the same thing all over again. And you know, when you bring up someone's past failures in that negative light in a critical way, do you know what it produces in that person? It produces in them the emotion of, why even bother trying anymore? I'll just quit. Because nothing I do will ever be good enough, and nothing I do will ever outlive my past. So I'll just give up. Those are damnable words. Your, your, your words are now dripping with the anointing of the accuser of the brethren. When you speak to someone like that, and you bring up the offenses in the past that they have sought forgiveness for. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 7. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Now look at that. Love bears all things, it believes all things, it hopes all things. In other words, you choose to believe the best about a person. Okay? 
And what happens is at times something occurs or something is said, something is decided, something is done, and we immediately attack the person and say, well, you did that because you're arrogant, you're proud, you're selfish, you were only thinking of yourself, you were trying to hurt me, that's why you did that, right? And many times, it was just a thoughtless thing. If that person had known how it was going to affect you, they would have never had done it. They, they genuinely do not want to hurt you, but they did this without fully thinking about all of the consequences. And so I put there in your notes, when, when things like this happen in our relationships, and our communication, address the issue without attacking the person. And don't automatically assume the worst, but believe all things, hope in all things, endure all things, uh, believe the best about the person, put that other person in the best possible light. And if something has caused you harm or hurt or inconvenience or maybe even sacrifice, go to them and in a spirit of meekness and love and gentleness and peace and say, hey, you know, can we just... Can we talk about this certain thing that you said? Or can we talk about this decision that you made? Or can we talk about what you did? And I just, I, I just felt a need. I, I wanted to let you know that it affected me in this negative way. And especially if you're talking about a Christian, more than likely they're going to come back with, with the response of, oh, I am so sorry, I wasn't even thinking. And I'm sorry, please forget. How can I make it up to you? So... Assume the best. Don't automatically assume the worst and don't attach blame to their character. Address the issue without attacking the person. Next one. Speak the truth in love. Love is the vehicle that conveys the truth. Especially when what needs to be, when what needs to be said will be hard to hear. You know, this is where the tenderheartedness comes in. When you know you know, a, a certain climax has reached in a, uh, has been reached in a situation or relationship where something needs to be said, and you know that what you need to say is going to be hard to hear, be very kind and very tender-hearted in how you frame what you need to say, how you present it, how you say it. Make it as easy as possible on them to hear what you need to say. Speak the truth how? In love. And you know, I don't know, several years ago, the church kind of imitated the world in, in saying, well, this is tough love. You know, you, you just need some tough love, and here I'm going to give you some tough love. And um, really what it came down to is what you did really made me mad, and so you sit right down, and, and you're going to be the focus of all of my anger and blame, and I'm just going to vent my frustration, and you've got to sit there and take it, because after all, this is just tough love. No, it's sin is what it is. It's you venting your emotion. When the Bible says here, speak the truth in love, this is not rocket science, okay? This isn't brain surgery. It's really simple. Speak the truth in love. What is love? 1 Corinthians says, love is kind, love is patient, love is gentle, love is not arrogant, love is not rude. Read it for yourself there in 1 Corinthians 13. So therefore, when I need to speak to you the truth, especially when that truth might be hard for you to hear, you have the assurance from the word of God that that truth is going to be spoken in love. It's going to be spoken in gentleness. It's going to be spoken in patience. It's going to be spoken in kindness. It's going to be spoken in a way that's not arrogant, in a way that's not rude. Speak the truth how? In love. Colossians 3, verse 19. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. You know, the people that are the closest to us, we end up hurting the most. And, and guys, you know, with our wives, the people that are trying to, help, trying to help us the most are the people we end up hurting the most. 
I mean, our wives are trying to love us and promote us and take care of us and trying to strengthen us in every way imaginable. And then for us to turn around and just be harsh or bitter, you know? Well, I told you to do this. What You do what you're told. I'm the boss of this house. Why haven't you done it yet? You know, and we just become sharp or harsh with them. You know what? Instead of demanding their submission, why don't you become a man that they want to submit to, that they're glad to submit to? Anybody that has to demand submission, I'm sorry, but they, they are an impotent little child, quite frankly. A real man with a true heart, with true passion, with true courage, with true character. A wife loves to submit to a man like that. So why don't you grow up and be a man? Be, be someone that inspires submission instead of having to demand uh, submission. Colossians 3, 21. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become what? Discouraged. That word provoke means to, to exasperate. And I put there in parentheses, keep the expectations age appropriate, you know? We, uh, we had Allie, our granddaughter, over at the house the other day. And she's five years old. She's a very typical five-year-old. And, uh, you know, Terry and I have had an empty nest now for many years. And so our house is generally very quiet, very peaceful, you know, a great place to live. And all of a sudden, this five-year-old invades, and she's chasing the dogs and playing with the dogs and throwing toys at the dogs and running up and down our steps. And then she, you know, she goes about five steps up our steps to the second floor, jumps all the way down to the main floor, bang, you know, like an explosion going off in the house. And, uh, now, at the same time, you know, there can't be anything that's out of order or unruly. But you know what? A five-year-old is going to be loud and noisy. And a five-year-old is going to shout and talk and giggle and laugh and run around and chase the dogs and have fun and jump down the steps that make a big boom when they land. And so, you know, you don't get all mad and angry at them and say, why don't you act like a grown-up? Well, it's because they're not a grown-up. They're a five-year-old, and they're just acting the way they're supposed to act. They're acting like children. You know, why can't you do anything right? Why can't you do that math problem? I've explained it to you three times. Are you stupid or something? See, those are words. That's how you provoke your children to wrath. Because you're, you're exasperating them. You're giving them a sense of hopelessness and futility. And they're children. They're growing up. They're going through life experience like a teenager does, and they're going to make mistakes and choose the wrong friends and choose the wrong things at times. And you can't exasperate them. You don't lower the standards. You, you keep the standard of the Word of God stable and sound at all times, but at the same time, you don't start to uh, exasperate them by expecting things of them beyond their growth and maturity. You lead them to the truth. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. Again, you know, when you get involved in a conversation, does the conversation always have to be all about you? And how you feel and what you like or what you dislike? Or... But in humility, count others what? More significant than yourselves. That's why I say this conversation is not about me. This conversation is how can I help you, strengthen you, encourage you, give to you. What are you going through? Count others more significant than yourself. Philippians chapter 2, verse 4. Let each of you uh, look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. In other words, put yourself in that other person's place, in that other person's position or condition or circumstance. What are they going through? What, what must they be feeling right now? How, how can I help them? Don't be just, stop being so self-absorbed in your own little world and, and learn how to think about someone else for a, for a change. 
Romans 14, verse 1. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. You know, some people get in a conversation and it turns into a debate. And you know, it, it turns into a debate over the dumbest things. And now I've got to win, man. I've got to prove I'm right and you're wrong. And it's all because you don't do things my way or see it my way or my opinion is superior to your opinion. And if it's not eternal, if it's not a matter of the word of God, give them their space. Let them have their own preferences and goals and desires in life. They don't have to do everything the way you do it. Don't end up quarreling over opinions about things that don't really matter in the light of eternity. Proverbs 29, verse 22, an angry man just stirreth up wrath, uh, stirreth up strife, excuse me, and a furious man aboundeth in transgression. And I put there in the notes, eliminate the negative emotion before you communicate. Don't communicate when you're angry. Don't communicate when you're spit and nails. I put there, abstain from any aggressive or abusive or heated words, tone of voice, facial expressions, gestures, body language. You know, I, I was once in a meeting with this other pastor of another church, and, uh, and we were talking. He was sitting in a chair. I was sitting in a chair, and we were disagreeing. We weren't in agreement. And he suddenly got up out of his chair, walked over towards the chair that I was sitting, became very uh, angry, very animated, raised his voice, started shaking his finger, you know, at me, talking to me in this loud tone of voice. I'm sitting in the chair looking up at him like this, as he, you know, really giving it to me. And I'm thinking, what part of Christ-likeness is this? And you know, I walked away from that thinking, you know, I don't have any animosity towards him. If I saw him on the street tomorrow, I would walk up and greet him and shake his hand, but I'm not getting in another conversation with him. You know, I'm, believe me, I learned my lesson. <laughs> I'm not going to get myself in a situation like that again. And that is the division that you create in relationships through how you communicate. So be very careful with how you say it, the tone of voice, the volume of voice, the body language, the facial expressions. If you do, if you communicate in anger, all you're doing is stirring up strife, creating wounds and hurts and divisions in relationships. Proverbs 18, verse 13, if one gives an answer before he hears, it is his folly and shame. You know, we, we hear one side of the story, and all of a sudden we, we become the ally of this person. Yeah, you're right, and they were wrong, and who do they think they are? And, you know, and now we side with this person. And then we go and we talk to the other person, and we hear the other side of the story, and we think, oh boy. I may have just made a big mistake. Because whenever there's a, a dispute or an argument or a disagreement, you know, very typically, most of the time, the blame does not rest on one person but both. There's things that both could have done better and differently. I mean, it is very, very rare when all of the blame rests on just one person. And so don't be foolish to take sides or, or to make allies based upon one side of the story. Hear both sides of the story before you make any certain judgment or communicate in a certain way. It's foolish not to do so. Ephesians 5, verse 18, and we're going to stop with this. Be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. When you, when you talk and speak to people, don't just talk out of your mind or talk out of your emotions or talk out of your flesh, whatever comes to mind first. Be filled with the Spirit. Are the words that you're speaking filled with the grace and the Spirit of God? Be filled with the Spirit. What is the origin and the source of what you're saying? And what is the Spirit behind what you're saying? 
Be filled with the Spirit. Let your words come from the Spirit and from the heart of God and stop speaking just out of your own selfishness or agenda or desires or feelings or emotions. Be filled with the Spirit as you talk. Now there's more here and, we're, and we've got to stop because we're way out of time. But you can just think about these other points that I put down here. The, you know, when you're ministering or talking to someone, give them your undivided attention. Listen for the message behind their words. Be available even when it's inconvenient. You may not get another chance to talk to them when they're ready to talk. Father, as we come to you this morning, we lift up our relationships and we lift up our communication to you. And we thank you for the relationships that you have given us. We see them as your blessing and your gifts to us. And we ask, Father, that we would communicate purely and properly in the relationships that we have. That we would minister grace and encouragement to one another instead of tearing each other down. Father, help us to have that heart. Father, let us be children of God that we, that we converse with one another as our Father converses with us. That our that our words contain the same life and grace that your word to us contains. Cause us to have relationships of fruitfulness and harmony and unity and growth instead of relationships of destruction and discouragement. Father, we thank you for your word to us now. And we ask that you would teach us and mold us in the ways that you want us to communicate and talk with one another. In Jesus' name, amen.